Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. Okay, today in the Dungeon Dive, we're going to take a brief look at Cairn, a very small uh, RPG in a zine, very uh, rules light system, and coupling that with Escape the City, which is a solo module that you can play with Cairn, or you can also play it with a D&D 5e. But I have chosen to play it with Cairn. Karen is a pretty cool little RPG system. I have not played this with a group yet or anything, so I can't quite say how it plays with a group, but I can imagine that it plays pretty well. One thing I do like about Karen in reading the book is it gives you a really nice detailed overview of the kind of game it is, of the philosophy behind the game. We have a uh, Karen was written with the following design philosophies in mind. It is a more of a classless system. Uh, neutrality, the warden or the GM's role is to portray the rules, situations, NPCs, and narrative clearly while acting in a, as a neutral arbiter. Um, death, characters may be powerful, but they are also vulnerable to harm in its many forms. Death is always around the corner, but it is never random or without warning. Uh, they emphasize player choice, fiction first various principles. The warden and the players each have guidelines that help foster a specific play experience defined by critical thinking, exploration, and an emergent narrative. Uh, growth. Uh, characters are changed through in-world advancements, gathering new skills and abilities by surviving dangerous events and overcoming obstacles, and shared objectives. Uh, the game Karen is an adventure game for one facilitator, the Warden, and at least one other player. And it was uh, uh, content designed and layout by Yochai Gal. It does have a nice little simple character sheet that I do really enjoy. Nice look there. And a nice rules summary on one page towards the end of the book. So after the uh, guiding principles of the, the, the philosophies of the design of Cairn, after that section, it goes into a list of principles for the warden and a list of principles for the players. I do really like that. Sometimes, uh, sometimes RPGs just kind of throw the players and the GM into the deep end, and they assume that maybe they are coming to the game with a certain amount of knowledge. And that does happen a lot with indie games because indie games are, they, they do seem to be focusing on a very core group of game players who are approaching the hobby with a lot of knowledge. You kind of have to have a lot of knowledge to seek out games like these because you're not just going to stumble upon these at like Toys R Us or Amazon very easily like you would uh, Dungeons and Dragons or one of the bigger systems. And so those games, the more mass market games, and there's nothing wrong with those. I love D&D 5e, but those games usually will approach, will have a section in their books about like what is an RPG? And they will kind of guide the players in to their worlds with uh, more uh, guiding principles. And uh, Karen does that. And I think it's really good for that. So in that sense, I think Karen is kind of a, I would say it's kind of an entry level indie RPG. And so if you're looking for something like that, Karen might be a good game for you. But uh, character creation is pretty simple. You just have three traits. We can look at the character uh, page here, the character sheet. We have strength, dexterity, and will. We have an armor value, a hit point value, but it's called a hit protection value because Karen uses a system where as you go down to zero HP, anything beyond that, you start taking away your stats. So zero HP doesn't necessarily mean uh, dead, but if you reach a zero HP exactly without going under, then you get some kind of major wound, like a scar. And then you can also become deprived as you uh, starve or as you uh, grow thirsty. And then you have a limited number of inventory slots. You have 10 inventory slots and you can keep uh, you know, one piece of inventory in each hand, a uh, back, head, that kind of thing. You can keep six things in a backpack, but also as you become damaged, you might become fatigued and you will have to check off an inventory slot. So that's one less thing you can carry until you, until you get healed and until you heal yourself of that fatigue. It's a very simple system. 
but its uh, mechanisms also point towards being governed by uh, narrative decisions and they have narrative impact on the mechanisms and I do really enjoy that. So character uh, scores are tallied by rolling 3d6 and that is your score. You can swap two. So the character that I rolled up to play Escape the City with, uh, Harlan Peters, of course, my typical name, uh, was a mercenary. That it was his background. Um, his age is 32. I started with 10 gold. I have a strength of 13, a dexterity of 17, and a will of 10. Uh, tests are very simple. You roll a d20 and you want to... Uh, meet or roll under your various uh your stats so for anything having to do with strength i would need to roll a 13 or under on a d20 my armor is one because i'm wearing a leather jerkin uh combat in this game is very fast and very deadly you don't roll to hit you just roll to do damage and damage is mitigated by your armor the rest of the damage goes to hit points if hit points fall below zero then you start taking it out of your regular stats so for instance, I have, I'm armed with two daggers, so I get to roll 2d6 for my damage. And because I have two, I get to pick the best one. So this one I could do, so on this roll here, I would do five points of damage. If my opponent was wearing a, a point, a one point of armor, I would do four points of damage to them. And if they only had uh, three hit points, then as, as enemies go down to zero hit points, they are, uh, you have won that combat. So hit protection, that is your hit points. Uh, hit, uh, HP does not indicate a character's health or fortitude, nor do they lose it f uh, for very long because it's pretty easy to heal your hit protection. Um, if an attack takes a PC's HP exactly to zero, they must roll on the scars table. And the, the scars are pretty interesting. You will roll a D12. You can have a lasting scar. You can become walloped. You can get a broken limb, diseased. Um, hamstrung, uh, deafened, rebrained, <laughs> re some hidden part of your psyche is knocked loose. Roll 3d6. If the total is higher than your will, take a new result. Take the new result. Really interesting. So again, it is kind of narrative focused. Uh, the, the, me the mechanisms are more narrative focused. I do really enjoy that. And then you also have a really cool background for rolling up your characters' names. You have a list of uh, 20 female names and 20 male names. You have surnames. And then you have your backgrounds here. And you also have a whole bunch of different things like your, uh, your physical traits, skin color, hair, you know, the kind of hair you have, your uh, face style, uh, speech, clothing, virtue, vice, reputation, and misfortune. So Harlan Peters here, he's kind of lanky, he's tan-skinned, he has curly hair, uh, a sunken face, he is cryptic in his speech, he is cautious, nervous, wise, and was condemned for something. And so these are kind of keywords that you might want to keep in mind to maybe dictate some of your uh, role-playing decisions there. Then you also have some starting gear. So you can start with uh, certain uh, types of armor, helmets, weapons, um, ex exploration gear, um, tools, trinkets, and bonus items. I chose to use one of the class bundles. So these are like gear packages. So even though in this game you don't have a class, you could tailor your gear towards a certain kind of a class uh, to give your character to, to maybe match their background. So because I was a mercenary and a little lanky, I chose that I might have the things that a thief has. So I started with two daggers, a hooded jerkin, lock picks, caltrops, a grappling hook, and a metal file. So the rules are, are quite simple. I've gone over most of the rules. Really, it does have a reaction chart for when you are uh, dealing with NPCs. So you could use that in conjunction with the oracles that we'll take a look at in um, Escape the City there. It goes into a little bit about how you uh, have your wealth and treasure, and most things are, are, are uh, measured in gold points. You can create hirelings to hire them. They're very, they're more simplified characters. And then when your main character dies, you can take up the role of one of your hirelings to continue the adventure. It goes into combat. Again, combat is very deadly. You are way better off trying to avoid combat in this game. Uh, it has a very simple bestiary, but a really cool way, a really cool and simple and fast way of creating monsters. There are 100 spells in the game, and the spells are very simple. 
and they're all done on this uh, D100 chart. So if I had the spell of 90, uh, 90, then let's see what spell I would have here. A uh, spell on a 90 roll would be the Summon an Idol. Uh, a carved stone statue the size of a mule rises from the ground. Okay, so very simple. It gives you a kind of a narrative hook, and then you could use that to um, to come up with something to help push the story forward. Because again, Karen is a very narrative driven game. So Escape the City. Escape the City is a tool system uh, that you could add onto Karen to play Karen as a solo game. Uh, it's while Karen uses a more simple set of rules. Escape the City is a little bit more complex and it is best to think of or to not think of Escape the City as simply a four against darkness style overlay because on its surface it kind of looks like a four against darkness style game where you are going to be crawling through a city or you could say a, a dungeon in terms of in the uh, case of, of um, four against darkness but in escape the city you are going to be drawing cards to generate locations then you will also be drawing cards to generate um, encounters but it's not just a simple point crawl or a a uh, hex crawl system where you will uh, have a very simple encounter with a something where you will roll and you will do damage and then you will win that encounter and move on you could probably play it like that you could play it like a very simple four against darkness game but i don't think you're going to get a lot out of it if you approach it in that way the way that uh, escape the city should be approached is when you generate a location coupled with an encounter that is then a little role-playing scenario that you want to come up with creative solutions and then use the various oracles in um city in escape the city or if you have other oracles that you enjoy using using those using that npc that small npc oracle in cairn and then role play out that encounter it's not like um, Four Against Darkness or Fighting Fantasy book where you just go to encounter, roll some dice, look at the results, and move on. You will get a lot more out of this game if you think of it more in terms of this being a module for a solo RPG, a full solo RPG adventure using Cairn as the rules. I think you will also get a lot more out of it if you do some journaling coupled with its structured play because what escape the city does is it gives you a definitive goal that you are trying to work for so in that sense it does or work towards i should say so in that sense it does work very well as a solo game but if you're not keeping track of what's happening you may lose some of the impact of the things of your adventure and so while journaling is not um it's not the focus of escape the city i think it just will make your adventure more memorable so let's kind of take a look at what we're doing in escape the city so escape the city an army of mysterious assailants has infiltrated the island city of wota ru for unholy purposes unfortunately your plans for a peaceful evening enjoying the wota ru culture will not come to pass there are only four bridges out of the city and all span dangerous rapid, rapid filled ravines. You will learn that each is guarded by a formidable foe. Escape the City is designed for one to four characters playing Cairn or 5e. If using 5e, uh, third level characters are recommended. Where stat blocks differ, the system will indicate in parentheses uh, afterwards. So to play the game, you take a standard deck of cards. And you're going to uh, separate those cards into two decks with the black suits and the red suits. The red suits will be your locations. The black suits will be your encounters. And in this game, you are looking for three secrets. And depending on the direction you are moving, if you're moving north, south, east, or west, each secret you discover will tell you something about the guard that is guarding the bridge that leads to your escape in that direction 
And once you have found three different secrets from three different suits, so one secret each from like a heart, spades, um, a diamond, or a club, you need three of those. Once you have found three secrets in one direction, then you have found the bridge and you have found the guard that you need to defeat or get past in order to escape from the city because the city is being overrun by these crazy zealots who are completely destroying the city and causing all kinds of trouble and chaos. So a really cool system. I, I enjoy that. I like that you have a definitive goal. It creates a kind of board game like structure, but because the encounters are open-ended and they set an interesting stage, it still does feel a little bit like a role-playing game. Really enjoy that. And it's easy to add to Cairn because Cairn is so simple. Um, Escape the City is pretty simple as well. So it doesn't become cumbersome and it doesn't become uh, like just kind of overwrought with too many rules. So let's uh, generate a, an account here and let's kind of see what was, what was going on. So from here, I was going south. I guess we could kind of take a look at um, what my adventure has happened so far. I have not been journaling at all. I just haven't been... I haven't felt like writing uh, <laughs> this morning, but I started here. So I started at the location of a nine of diamonds. So let's see. Let's uh, take a look at the location uh, nine of diamonds here. So I started uh, the street passes under an archway holding up another street. A risky, rocky climb leads to an upper street. You have four different exits. So here you can kind of think, okay, maybe two of the exits are above, two of them are below. If you wanted to reach the upper exits, you might want to make a dexterity um, test to, to climb to those. Uh, maybe if you fail, then you can only go on the bottom. So you could uh, think of different ways to role play that location. That encounter, though, was a king of spades. So at this location, I also encountered this here. And that would be um, a stairway uh, leads down into a tunnel. It uh, can be seen from one side of the street. Two zealots sit on the other side of the street fingering loot they captured. So I saw two zealots and they had a gold necklace that they were um, holding. And so I could you know, try to steal that necklace or maybe fight the zealots to take that gold. Or I could sneak by them to go into the tunnel. And that's what I did. I snuck by them. And traveling through the tunnel takes you underground and lets you skip a city block. You overhear the zealot speaking through the sewer gate. So I drew a secret. So I decided that that was going to go south. So I discovered a secret heading south. And the first secret I discovered heading south I drew was for an ace of clubs. I think that might have been the wrong secret deck because... Uh, figuring out which deck you draw from secrets was a little tricky to me. I'll go over that in just a minute, but it doesn't make that big of a difference. But uh, my first secret that I found was an ace of clubs. So the guard that I'm going to be fighting, if I continue south, if, if the south guard is the one I discover, was bolstered by allies. So he loses confidence as allies fall or flee. And so you will have... When you come across your final base bridge guard, you will roll a D3 and this will be your base guard. And then you will add whatever secrets you have found to that guard. So your guard might have a certain number of attacks, of attacks that you've discovered that they will have, a certain number of minions, perhaps, some characteristics and some certain powers. So the way you discover a secret is if you discover your secret from a location then you have discovered a red secret. So you draw another location card to determine which secret you have discovered. If you discover your secret from an encounter, you have discovered a black secret and you will um, draw your secret card from the black deck, from the encounter deck. And then that will determine which of the charts you are looking on for your secrets. But here... Um, from here, the seven of hearts location, let's see what that location is, a seven of hearts here. So from a narrow alleyway filled with trash leads off the main road, the crooked buildings hang over a damp path. Um, so I'm going to head south. So let's take a look at what I'm heading to if I'm going south. So south, I'm going to draw this location is a three of diamonds. So 
So I'm just kind of using a node system here. You could draw it out. I'm going to draw my three of diamonds here. Okay, so let's see what this location has in store for us. This is the location description. Three of diamonds. Okay, a dim green glow fills a block of brick buildings. The street is filled with people frozen in place and glowing like emeralds. They seem to be fleeing from something ahead. Exits. Okay, so there are two exits here. So you could uh, roll to determine randomly where the other exits are. So there are two more exits. So we could look at the directions here. So we could say, okay, the two exits are the other two. So we already have one to the north. One thing I'm not quite clear on is if the exits are in addition to the way you've come, or is it just one more exit? I've kind of been playing with a combination of both because I keep going back and forth on how I want to interpret that rule. I think I've landed on it having two additional exits. So we have, um, or you could play that if it has two exits and you roll one that you already know about, then maybe it only has one additional exit. So a three here would be east. Okay, so we have an exit to the east here and then one more roll. Another one to the east. So we could say that that is both of our exits because uh, we have one and one. You could play like that or you could go ahead and have two new exits. I could keep stop rolling a three there. <laughs> How many times in a row am I going to roll a three? Okay, I'm going to say that's a four. Okay, hilarious. Okay, I hate I hate rolling D4s. They just they are the least fun die to roll. Um, a west. Okay, so we have an exit that can go over here like that. So we move into this location. We move into that. Uh, what was it? We move into the dim green glow. Okay, so what's interesting here is we do have these people who are like statues and they're glowing like emeralds. Well, there is a, a random table here for the frozen green citizens. So we could, when you touch a character that has been frozen with green light, the encasing shatters and shards of green glass fall to the ground. What happens when you break the spell? So we could touch one of these frozen green citizens to see what happens. But let's first draw a uh, location encounter and see what is happening here at the Three of Diamonds spot. I drew that from the uh, discard there. Okay, so an Eight of Clubs. So let's see what kind of encounter we're going to have here. An Eight of Clubs. The symbol of the Church of Haas, the god of the three rivers, hangs over a series of simple beds. Three priests tend to the bed's occupants, but the bodies aren't moving. When you approach, the zealot priests will try to cover your mouth with a rag. A strong smell puts you to sleep after a successful grapple. Okay, so there's some kind of building here. Perhaps there's a makeshift um, little prison encampment that we have stumbled across. And there are some zealots and they are capturing people. Or some kind of a nefarious deed or something so we could try to sneak past them and we would try to sneak past them going in a certain direction i would think so we can go to eight so this was the eight of clubs i just want to keep track of my encounters there so let's just, let's say we try to sneak past them going to the west here so i want to make a dexterity check to sneak past the zealots um I have a 17 and I rolled a five. Okay, so I successfully snuck past the zealots. I'm not going to encounter them or anything. I don't want to, uh, I don't need to search for anything. I know there are no secrets in this location because if I was, if it was a secret, I would be told to. So this is just kind of more of a simple encounter. And now I'm heading to the west. So now let's see the location to the west is a five of hearts here. Okay, a uh, mini domed greenhouse is encircled by a road of fine pavers. The doors are ajar. You can go through or around. Okay, there are three different exits here. So because there are three exits, I believe that would be all exits. So we know that this, uh, these two areas now connect somehow. So this was a five of hearts. Okay, so let's see the uh, location that we come to here. That would be a two of spades. 
two teenagers, a boy and a girl, uh, Sack Bell and Calm Pundy, hide nearby, mostly concealed and holding each other in fear. They were visiting the city when the zealots arrived. Now they just want to get away. They tell you what they know about what is ahead. Draw a secret. Okay, so we drew this secret from the spades deck, from the uh, locations deck. So we're going to draw another secret from, or now we're going to draw our secret from that deck. And because we were headed west, then that secret is going to be about the guard that is guarding the west bridge. So let's see, this is the first secret for the west bridge guard. And it is a four of clubs secret. So I would look at this and it would tell me a little, a characteristic about this guard. Uh, he, the guard is heavily made up. So the guard is a vein. Interesting. So that could be a certain way that you might want to role play that guard. Maybe you could appease to that guard's sensibilities of being vain in order to escape. It wouldn't necessarily have to be a combat encounter. But so far, all kinds of different things have happened in my adventure trying to escape the city. I went in this tunnel down here and it was blocked by a mummy. I used my torch to burn the, the, the mummy. But rolling up on the, um, on the uh, oracle here, the outcome, it was positive but. So I said that the burning, uh, the, the burning uh, bandages of the mummy just caused kind of like the whole tunnel to be engulfed in flame. So my way north there was blocked. Over here, a building, a, a crumbling tower fell and I was able to escape it. And But that way was blocked now. Here, I ran into a, a, a pack of, of, of mangy dogs who were um, accosting a woman. They were trying to uh, bite the woman and I threw some rations to distract the guards, uh, to distract the dogs so I could save the woman. And she told me a secret about the uh, guard that was, uh, of the bridge to the south. So as you can see, you could play this game in a very simple kind of four against darkness manner, but that's not really where this game's strength lie, where this module's strengths lie. This module is much better if you approach it in, um, in such a way that, that it creates little role playing scenarios for you to think about and for you to progress through. So depending on what your location describes and what your encounter describes, then you can look at your stats, you know, you can look at your gear, you could uh, think about your character's background, what kind of character they are, and then you could play a little simple solo role playing scenario to come up with interesting ways to bypass those locations and those encounters using the various oracles, using the details, you can look for treasure. Um, again, if we wanted to touch one of those uh, citizens, let's see what would have happened uh, to uh, the person inside falls to the ground asleep. They can be awoken with an action. Okay, So if you woke them up, uh, maybe you could have them be an NPC or a hireling that you could take on. So if your character died, maybe you would take the role then of that person who is continuing to escape uh, this city. You do have some tips and special circumstances such as flight. Um, idle time for every 10 minutes of an action given it in a location you can draw another card you can pass through buildings so you could like enter buildings and then roll up on some of the details of maybe what is inside that building um, there are you know, interesting intersections engaging encounters so i think that the more effort you put in to escape the city the more fun you will have out of it so even though it does have that kind of structured play, it is more of a board game like module because it does give you an end goal and a definitive way to reach that goal. The more effort you put into it and the more you kind of turn this city into your sandbox to play in, I think you will have more fun with it than if you just approach it like a simple kind of four against darkness city crawl. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed taking this kind of brief look at Cairn and a, a little bit more of a detailed look at Escape the City. I think these two are a good pair. I think Cairn is an interesting indie RPG that could be a good kind of first step into this direction. And I think Escape the City is a pretty cool little module tool to throw on top of Cairn for some cool solo or some fun solo role playing within this system and within this city. Sorry guys, we'll hope you enjoyed this video. We will talk to you later. Bye-bye.